Hello and welcome to the CX Files podcast. I'm your host, Mark Hillary. Martin Hill Wilson is one of the best known CX advisors from the UK. He's been training, advising, and mentoring CX leaders for decades now, and his company, Brain Food Consulting, is presently focused on emotive CX for customer interactions. Now, this is a subject we've talked about on CX Files before, especially when exploring how to decide when a human is needed to interact with the customer, or a process can be automated. However, Martin has spent several years researching this subject in such detail that his articles and essays on the topic are far more detailed and interesting than anything produced by other advisors in the area. I called Martin so we could focus on Emotive CX for an entire episode of CX Files. Okay, so let's go straight to the interview. Okay, so Martin, um, over the last few months I've been looking at your, your LinkedIn and I can see that you're writing a lot of stuff about Emotive CX and how managers planning customer service are sometimes forgetting the value of a human element, you know, the human touch. Um, could you elaborate a little bit about this theme uh, and maybe give some examples of what, what's making you focus on this right now? Well, the very, the very genesis of it was actually... Um, a quote, one of these great marketing stats I came across a while back, which said that uh, emotionally connected customers are worth twice as much. Um, it was from a webinar that I was doing, and I chased down the research for that. Uh, and it was some good research in North America. It's been running for quite a long time now. But it was in the context of marketing and branding. Um, and in that context of if I'm a Burberry customer or something, you know, I, I feel that my life is altogether richer and more meaningful because I'm a Burberry customer, then being emotionally connected, I'm probably going to shout out twice the amount that I would do. And that just got me thinking that, you know, marketeers and branding folk have known the fact that we can link to customers emotionally for ages, you know, ever since the beginning of advertising. In fact, we've just come out of the Christmas period and given the fact that all retailers in the UK are having a right existential moment right now, it's amazing that they've still stumped up the Christmas advert, which, you know, runs into millions. And I think they do that simply because they want to get connected emotionally to customers to then suggest they spend silly amounts of money. And what occurred to me was that we don't leverage that same insight in the context of uh, customer service. And so that was one of the reasons that got me excited about thinking, well, why don't we transpose that into the context of customer service, which, by the way, thinking about it, we don't phone call centers to celebrate life is marvelous. We tend to phone call centers where there's a problem. So from an emotive perspective, it's likely to be a negative one. Uh, and in today's world, we expect to be served both functionally, but also have the way that we feel taken into consideration as well. So that triggered me. Um, second thing that triggered me was the fact that, as, as, as you know, we have previously discussed, automation and bots is taking the low-hanging fruit. So what happens to the folk? And then the last thing is from a Forrester thing and the, and, and the Nunwood material, which is, you know, CX itself has been flatlining for a couple of years now. And I think there's a number of reasons, but one of them I would give is that it's become a bit institutionalized and that we've forgotten that in the center of experience is emotion. So bundle all that together, I thought it'd be a great opportunity to introduce it into the call center. Yeah, that's interesting. And I saw one example that you shared where a hotel guest in China called reception asking for some coffee pods for their machine. Uh, and they opened the door to find a robot delivering the, uh, the pods of coffee. You know, and, and, and it's crazy because that's really efficient. You can see where there's an efficiency gain there for the hotel. But it completely removes the ability um, for any kind of humor inter you know, human interaction. I mean, seeing someone there smiling and asking how your day is as well as giving you the coffee. So d does this pretty much summarize what you're talking about? Well, completely, yes. And, and, you know, I've noticed even before we got into this part of the discussion that those people who have had a lot of self-service going down, salespeople go, hang about, we've missed an opportunity to cross-sell or upsell. So there is always a serendipity to a human face-to-face, live-live conversation that you lose when you start to automate it. Um, and coming back to that corridor thing, you know, it all depends. I mean, I'm not against you know, a little bot going up and down a corridor per se delivering something, but I do think that most people are going to, as normal, rush into this without really considering what's been lost and what's been won. And if you step back a bit, I think the big design challenge we're going to have for, I don't know, 
50 years is when is it virtual, when is it digital, and when is it human, and when is it physical? And the answer to that is a blend. And I think that we need to think very, very carefully when there is mutual benefit for both the brand and the customer when we go automated and digital, which let's face it is convenient and can scale. And then when it needs to be physical, when it needs to be human, because it's about emotion, it's about complexity, maybe it's about the quality of the relationship. And the design challenge is to know when to meet the right way of delivering that particular need. And if you get it wrong, you're either going to lose the relationship that gets a bit too brittle, or if you stay on the human side too long, you're going to end up with an operating model that's just too damned expensive because everyone has gone down the automation and the bot route. So it's it's going to be a really interesting future. But these little indicators we have of people turning up, you know, where it used to be a human knocking and now it's somebody else, or there's a natural language talking at you as opposed to a real cashier, you know, all these is little bits of chipping away at what used to be basically a live human world surrounding me. And it's been replaced increasingly now with an automated one. Yeah, and we're increasingly seeing self-service become important now as well because the customers are going to Google or Alexa before they ever try contacting the brand directly. And then even when they do contact the brand, quite often they're deflected with um, an automated chatbot or some other system that, that prevents yep. them getting access to a human, you know, to try and fix those, those simple problems first. Um, doesn't this mean that we'll naturally find that the agents who are actually in the contact center are only ever going to be engaging on more emotive and complex problems? Yes, that's the direction of travel. I think that's a really well-observed point. Um, what I would say uh, against that is that if you don't do a good job in terms of making the self-service easier than engaging with a human, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to go back to talking to people. So IVR has become symbolic over 20, 30 years of the frustrations of poorly automated self-service. You know, Google, uh, Alexa, um, um, a smart speaker, um, a chat bot, um, a kiosk, any of those things can either be wonderful or dumb, depending how you've designed it. And the fact of the matter is humans have got very little tolerance for things not working. So if you don't make it work, I will be back into the queue. So in answer to your question, if you've done a great job on self-service, yes, I absolutely agree. The direction of travel for people will be to concentrate on the higher value human to human engagements. But you've got to nail the proactive, you've got to nail the self-service correctly, or you're not going to create that leeway in the space for the human component of your service to evolve in that direction. Yeah, so you mean that actually um, you need a self-service strategy as well. You can't just rely on a customer searching Google for information on your product and they're going to automatically get the right information. Oh, correct. And one of the interesting things about, uh, about self-service is this. Um, I can remember maybe half a dozen years ago listening to the person at the time responsible for O2. You know, they were in charge of customer service and they'd done the analysis, which says over 50 percent of all their inbound uh, contacts could and should be self-serve. And by the way, guess what? All customers are on mo mobile, smartphones, at the time, you know, whatever. It's a natural thing to, to automate that. And they eventually got their self together. They eventually got the knowledge organized. They rewrote it and did all the stuff. And he said it was interesting in the first year that they succeeded in terms of getting customers to start to use the FAQs and the search routines and all the rest of the stuff. However, of that percentage of customers that did that, half of them then subsequently phoned in and said, I've just been on your website and read this. Can I just check that that's the case? Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and, um, and what's really interesting about that phenomena, and transpose that now into the context of a bot delivering that piece of, of, of knowledge, is the design skills that need to go in to making sure people have the confidence and the trust in that. So in other words, it is not just a technical problem that we're looking at to make self-service work. It's a problem of really probably getting to a very detailed micro level of understanding what takes place in a human to human communication. I mean, in the serendipity of saying, oh, and by the way, could I ask this, which obviously, you know, often happens. And it's the convenience of being able to actually get a number of things sorted, 
or asking things in a certain way. And, or, for example, the customer nine times out of ten, you've just got to look at search routines, by the way, to know that most of us as customers are massively illiterate in our request for a particular outcome. Yeah, we just mumble most of the time. And if you look at Google, it does a terrific job at discombobulating that nonsense and making sense of it. But most bots are fairly literal still in their understanding of intent. Um, and so therefore humans naturally compensate by asking more questions until we get to a point of clarity. So it's those kinds of capabilities that need to be transposed into effective self-service strategies before customers are going to go, do you know what? Actually, I like the 24-7, I like the availability, and by the way, it delivers me relevant answers that means I don't have to go and talk to a human. But until you get to that point, you are going to find that people will go back to what they're familiar with, sitting in a queue, whether or not it's text or voice at the end of the queue. So surely this focus on um, emotive CX means that we need to rethink the, the skills and the profile of the people actually in the contact centers themselves. Uh, I mean, even down to the level of how do we reward them? Uh, you know, you can't really just pay people the legal minimum wage if they've got great customer facing skills. You know, they can interact with people, but they can also handle all these new technologies that are in the contact center, such as the automation systems. You know, we're, we're looking at getting really highly skilled people these days. Uh, great question. Um, the course I'm doing at the moment on it, that's a whole workshop, which is rethinking what does what, what are the implications of this? If we if we are assuming that, uh, you know, humans play a valuable role in connecting with customers at an emotive level, Customers appreciate that it works in terms of loyalty and commercial value. Therefore, these people need investing in. Have we got people right now who are suitable? And as a very, very crude statement of where the industry has trended in the last 20 years, we've hired people to take the volume, not the quality. So by definition, all transformation, well, all change I've ever noticed, tends to follow the following rule of thumb. A third a third get retrained, a third get recruited, and a third get to exit the door. And I think that we will see a similar thing taking place as Emotive CX takes hold, which is that not everybody will find themselves capable of the basic skills. You know, so what are we talking about Emotive? We're talking about the ability to really connect and understand how another person feels. So empathy, you know, the full gamut of emotional intelligence. Um, you need to come with a certain degree of that um, although that can be enhanced through learning and development, you need to have that as a basic capability. So we need to go right the way back to reprofiling who we're after, going back into the recruitment, and guess what? You pay for what you get. So I think those kind of people who will be attracted will uh, be of a different kind of catchment. I think their expectations for the culture, the environment, the package, the management style, everything will need to be recalibrated to keep those people in place. And then to the point that you made, if we try to teach, treat them like, you know, um, time, time machines, which basically means every single second we've got to be productive in a highly prescriptive sort of way, that's not going to work. And what do we mean by productivity in this new environment? Uh, and how do we recognize that? So, you know, if, if a motive is, is one of the new lenses, A, we need to be able to track that in terms of our MI. We need to be able to embed that then into things like performance management, into the quality review uh, situations, into the learning and development capabilities. Um, so there's a different emphasis that we're going to have to have. And also what we are looking and seeking to recognize will have to be different at the end of the day, which then takes us back to objective setting and the whole performance stack. So... The work that I've done so far, and I've run one course with you know half a dozen brands, it, it turned into a very, very interesting conversation. And the plan that they fed back as a result of that, you know, re-examining the core activities that we traditionally do in contact centers, a lot of them saw that they can build on their foundations, but they are progressing to a fundamentally different approach if they think through the uh, implications of emotive CX. Yeah, that's interesting. And you mentioned the management intelligence there, because um, that's one thing I was really thinking about is if uh, the companies that you're speaking to about Emotive CX, are they actually redesigning the metrics that they use to measure success? I mean, for example, if, if we're seeing customer interactions today are becoming more complex, more conversational, uh, taking longer, for example, then 
uh, those old measurements of call length and so on, they're, they're surely becoming outdated. Well, yes, I think they are. Um, and to that degree, whilst we still use those metrics, I think we've recognised for a couple of years now that call lengths are actually getting longer. And that's not a failure of productivity. That's simply because some of the easier things are now being deflected to more automated, self-service orientated ways. So um, I think that we are definitely moving into... Um, you know, a different kind of era where we need to focus on different kinds of outcomes. So getting uh, feedback from customers is an obvious thing. In other words, if we have tried to engage you and delivered something that works functionally and also emotively, how did you feel about that? You know, did we succeed? So whether or not you use effort, emotive, NPS, whatever the heck you're going to use, we need some validation back from the customer. Have we done a good job? Um, explicitly from the customer. Um, there is then a generation of technology that's beginning to grow through, whether or not it's you know, traditional speech or text analytics. Because again, let's bear in mind that we are not just talking about voice here. We are also talking about text at, at the same time, um, different ways of engaging. Uh, analytics can help. There is a whole new class of, 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 of analytics called emotive analytics, which is still actually primarily based on facial recognition. But again, we seem to think that we can spot the emotive states of customers. Now, some of that work is under review at the moment from some of the leading neurologists uh, like Lisa Feldman Barrett, who is arguing that we have a very, very prescriptive and slightly naive and inadequate way of understanding how emotions are expressed by humans. And they're much more individual and unique um, and therefore, we can't reduce things simply to an algorithm in the way that some people are already moving ahead. But nonetheless, we are going to have to have some form of automation in terms of listening to conversations and trying to understand the emotional component of that, measure it, and then use that proactively in terms of feeding back to the individual, but also using it for trend reporting and stuff. So to me, for example, you know, thinking about a typical journey, um, doesn't really matter, but your top two or three journeys that you have in your call center, you should get to a point where you know typically there are two or three predominant emotions that your customers begin with. You have thought quite clearly about the happier place you want to take them to by the end of that communication. Um, and you're going to be judging whether or not uh, individually and collectively as a service center, you manage to land them into a much more positive state because the underlying psychology, which will not surprise anybody who's listening to this, is that happy customers tend to stick around and people who are still in negative emotional states tend to disengage from brands. So, you know, roughly speaking, we want to take people to an appropriate reversal of the negative state that they are actually in. And there's the skilling of that. But to your point, there is also the, um, you know, the systems layer where we're tracking that, we're reporting on that. And we're also incentivizing that through uh, different forms of goal setting and all the rest of the stuff. So it's a big job to be done. Yeah, and I, I know that you wrote an article recently that referred to a book called The Power of Human by Adam Waits. And in there, he's warning that, that there could really be serious consequences to a reduction of interaction with other people. Um, I mean, he's talking about generally in society, but do you think that the automation of customer service is kind of like a canary in the coal mine? I mean, we're seeing um, the way that customers behave here, um, and we could actually be looking at something that, that's going wrong more generally in society. Well, it's funny, actually. The, 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 as I said, the genesis of this um, was from one of the customers that I work with, and, and the CEO came across from San Francisco having lived in England for a long time and bitterly complained about the degree to which America, in his view, had already gone down the wrong route of automation and created even further barriers and obstacles towards customers and brands engaging. You know, it was increasingly difficult to actually find a real life human to actually uh, engage with. Um, and, and the Adam Waits book is interesting because he says that although we've connected the world, ironically, we've ended up with quite the difference <laughs> outcome in terms of the human experience of that connectivity. Uh, and what's happened is we've actually got less uh, connection at a social human level than ever before. Uh, that's making people feel much more divorced. It's making people feel much more lonely. Um, you know, without singling stuff out, if you look at some of the more advanced AI nations on the world, which let's keep nameless for this discussion, 
Um, you can see the way in which it's been AI has been used to track people uh, and it's been used to basically keep people in fairly isolated bubbles, you know, and, and but not connected, you know, amongst themselves. And Waits is, makes the point that actually we are deeply social as creatures. You know, the human race is successful because of its skill at deciding that we collaborate to further our individual aims. In other words, the whole is greater than the individual. And so we're deeply social as beings. And that's why we are able to empathize and all the rest of the stuff. And it's not just for, you know, fun that we converse with each other. It actually is nurturing to us. It forms our identity. We, we learn from each other. Uh, and, and it keeps us sane, you know, at the end of the day. Um, and if we don't do that, he's got a great stat in the book, some research that says, by the way, people with strong social relationships tend to live twice as long as people with weak ones. And I remember a very old stat I, I, I've always been quoting, which is, I think there's a Polynesian culture somewhere, that their death penalty is to ban the criminal from any form of conversation with the village. And generally speaking, that ban results in that person being dead within 12 months. It's a terrible form of punishment. And it just says basically that unless we're connected at human level, you know, we do not thrive as human beings. So I think it's an early sign that we need to keep the balance or we will be imperiled as a result of that. And if call centers put too much automation as their form of delivery, then they will imperil the quality of the relationship with their customer base because it just doesn't suit us at that deeper level. Yeah, and, and I suppose the problem, though, is that uh, there's different customers have got different kinds of demands. I mean, you, you look around today and you yeah. see uh, younger people glued to their phones and their tablets and, and they demand the right to just be able to ask Alexa for help rather than actually speaking to a person. So, so how do brands handle uh, the fact that they've got these really differing customer expectations, but maybe it's it, you know it's a demographic difference, but but just just in general. Well, let's go back at it the other way around. I I I, I'm, I was just about to slip into the tr the traditional conversation about yeah we're gen gen you know situation and generation determine the degree of human connection, but let's look at it. Uh, if I just observe my own life and I've got um you know I've got a four year old, I've got an eight year old, um you know many friends from the age of 20 up to my age, sort of mid-60s. Um, we're undoubtedly on our smartphones. That's the first point. Uh, second point, we're primarily on messaging. But having said that, I notice that most forms of engagement are not <laughs> with bots or with virtual assistants or with automated systems. They're with our mates. So even the generations that we traditionally, you know, put up in front and say there, that's the generation that doesn't like to speak to people, et cetera, et cetera. Most of the time when they're on Facebook, TikTok or whatever you want, they're actually engaging with their social network, albeit over those platforms. So they are simply doing what I'm talking about, which is socially engaging with other humans using the current technology that is available to them. So I don't think there's been a tremendous change, in fact, amongst people and amongst consumers. What hasn't yet happened is businesses catching up in that kind of a way, uh, you know, and enabling them to do it. You know, we said before we started the conversation today that in your part of the world, you know, WhatsApp is absolutely sewn into the fabric about how people get their lives lived, you know, contact their bank, uh, you know, order tickets and all the rest of the kind of stuff. So, you know, we don't want to do dumb stuff through humans. It's just a cue. It's an unnecessary thing. We need to optimize that and be hugely efficient, use clever tech to be predictive and also to execute brilliantly. But there again, we still want to talk to people when it's appropriate, you know, at the end of the day. Now, whether brands have got good reasons for talking in that way to, to their consumers remains to be seen. I think you need to be distinguished these days as a brand, maybe purpose-driven. You know, if I'm doing something fabulous around of saving the world or I'm doing something fabulous around of, um, I don't know, diversity and inclusion or I'm doing something fabulous around of those kinds of things, then that kind of group that we typically talk about, you know, the millennials, they're attracted. They want to get involved with those organizations. They feel a connection to them. And to that extent, those organizations have got good reason to have human-to-human -human connection. But if I'm dull, there's no way I want to engage with you. So, I, you know, I think, I think there's something slightly broader here than just 
we don't want to talk to people. I think that the need to engage has to be examined and brands have to work increasingly hard to capture human to human and get the right to talk to people as far as that's concerned or be kept at the back of the queue and just have an automated relationship. That's the other part of it, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I suppose finally looking ahead because we're still at the beginning of the year, um, we're we're looking right ahead into 2020. How positive are you that brands are going to actually understand Emotive CX and and get this blend of automation, AI um, and access to humans right? I mean, are, are we learning from the mistakes? Uh, I think we're beginning to learn. Uh, yes, the funnily enough, um, if we go and think about the conferences, some of which we both attend, I think that some of the themes in the last two years have been bring back the human, <laughs> even though we haven't done a lot of automation in truth yet. So I think there's a, ne- a recognition of the human touch. Human is massive in sales. It's massive in marketing. It's massive in, in customer service. Um, so instinctively, we know we've got to preserve it. What that actually means, I don't think is well understood at all. I think if you go and talk to some of the design service agencies, you know, like Seren and EY and, you know, LiveWorks and people like that, I think these are the groups of people that are currently doing highly detailed work in organizations with their customers, figuring out where the human being sits in the delivery of the kind of digital services that we need today's world. But I think that's still very early. And I still don't think that's common wisdom uh, at the end of the day. And the mere fact that, you know, we can still run IVRs that upset people and not take them off stream and get them right again proves to me that I think many brands remain tone deaf to the emotive needs of customers uh, and think they can just get away with a, a, a kind of a functional relationship. So I don't think we're home and dry, but I do think that The organizations I'm talking to and attracting to the course, you know, I think is the front end of this whole conversation. Um, I can tell you that from the stuff I'm writing and the response I'm getting from that, that the level of interest is really high. So I think 2020 is going to be a year of raising awareness and committing to action. And people will start experimenting um, with it. But the, you know, what best practice looks like and and how to scale and roll that out, I think that's still a little bit further down the track. Thanks for listening to the CX Files podcast. Please take a moment to review the podcast because this helps other listeners to find it. And if you have any suggestions, then get in touch with me on Twitter or LinkedIn. I'm at Mark Hillary with two L's. Or just search Google for Mark Hillary.